All right. <clears throat> okay, let's get started. Um, we have uh, maybe a slightly atypical few weeks coming up, so um, I, I'm, I'm, I try and be more proactive as opposed to reactive. So uh, what that means is I spent the weekend going through sort of our class logistics for the next few weeks, and I wanted it to be clear, um, not just for you, but quite frankly for me as well. Um, so that everybody was aware of what was due and when, so I have a little table here coming up. Um, but just so you're aware in terms of everything today, so homework 5.3 is graded, the solution's posted, 5.4 is currently being graded, that solution is active right now. 5.5 is due today, um, and then 5.6 is assigned today. Now. 5.6 I'm assigning today, but I'm going to make that due on Friday. And the reason I'm making that due on Friday is because you have your first submission for your project due Wednesday. That way you don't have two things due at the same time. Is that fair? Okay. Now, what that does is it sort of shifts our homework schedules a bit. So uh, I've got this, okay? And um, I know that there's probably a couple of you that are like, you know, take, take a picture of this. Yeah. But um, I'll pose. But okay. So today, um, today what we're doing is we're discussing uh, shear and moment diagrams for hinges. And then this is kind of the lecture that I like to take a little bit of a step back and talk about internal indeterminacy because we talked about internal indeterminacy of trusses, but we haven't done that for beams and frames, so I'd like to do that today. Uh, and then on Wednesday, we're going to do shear and moment diagrams for frames. And that's going to be our last lecture on shear and moment diagrams. Now, these two lectures are going to be pre-recorded, okay? Uh, I'm pre-recording the one on Friday because it's green and white day, and I'm pre-recording the one on Monday because our, our uh, regular uh, ABET visit is, is uh, that day, or it's that week, but I've got meetings uh, myself uh, with some of our ABET reviewers that day. So I'm pre-recording these two lectures, okay? So homework 5.5 is due uh, today, and 5.6 is due Friday, right? So, like, our next few homeworks are kind of shifted down a little bit in terms of when they're due. So, it's like, uh, like homework 5.6 is assigned today, but it's due Friday. And homework 5.7 is assigned Wednesday, but it's due Monday. So, they're kind of shifted down a bit. Um, one homework assignment that truly is sort of bigger is homework 6.2. I would, not to, like, scare you or anything, but I'd say 6.2 is probably one of the more challenging homework assignments this semester, so much so that it is the only homework assignment that's worth 20 points and not 10, okay? But um, it's kind of an important assignment, so uh, I, I've, I've traditionally done that with this assignment. Um, and you've got, you truly do have two full lectures on that. It's not just one. The rest of the submissions are sort of downshifted a bit simply because of the project, okay? And so what's going to happen is when we come back, so the two pre-recorded lectures are introducing us to deflections uh, of beams and frames. So the first lecture, I actually pre-recorded that this morning, uh, is all about just the theory and the math and sort of setting the stage. This, this lecture is going to be on deflection problems dealing with beams with single moment functions, and then this one's going to deal with beams with multiple moment functions. Now, the reason I'm giving you an extra day on homework 6.2 is because of this lecture, this tips and tricks. Uh, lecture. I think it's really going to make your life a lot easier when doing deflection problems. And there's, a, I put a lot of thought into to doing this. What I had done in the past is I had assigned the homework, and then everybody turned it in thinking it was like one of the most painful things ever. And then I did the tips and tricks lecture, and I said, okay, now you can do it again. And they're like, oh, okay, it's a lot better. But I just decided this year, let's just have it, just do it once. Um, <clears throat> once we come back the next week, we're going to do deflections and frames. And I'm going to, uh, I have a, a brief note I want to discuss regarding shear deformations. And then that's basically it for deformations in this class. And so uh, exam two is going to be on beams, on shear and moment diagrams and deflections. And then uh, after the second exam, when we come back, we've got software applications. Uh, then we're going to do influence lines. Um, influence lines will be one of the bigger topics on the final. So. That's kind of the plan moving forward. So if you notice on Blackboard, I have posted all the notes from here to here, okay? 
And I know somebody uh, looked, he said, wait, do we have an exam next week? What's going on? No, no, the exam's not till like near Halloween. I just wanted to get everything straight, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, everybody good on that? All right, so that's our schedule for the next few weeks. Um, again, you know, take a picture of it, Instagram it, hashtag it, whatever you need to do. Okay, sound good? All right, don't forget, this is also uploaded to Blackboard. Okay, um, we have our derived relationship between loads, shears, and moments. That hasn't changed. You know, the idea that to get the shear diagram, I integrate the loads, and to get the moment diagram, I integrate the shear diagram. Um, again, what we're, we're not really employing the straight calculus relationships, although we can. Uh, there's nothing to say that we can't write a function, let's say, for shear as a function of x and integrate. I mean, we can do that. There's nothing to say we can't. It's just maybe a bit overkill for some of the problems that we do. Uh, a lot of times we can um, develop a graphical approach to constructing shear and moment diagrams, which we've been using for the past few lectures. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, I'd like to take a second before we get into shear and moment diagrams for hinges, or for, for uh, yeah, for beams with uh, hinges. I'd like to go back to this because we actually haven't talked about this. Um, if you recall, let's take a look at what's going on over here on the left. Uh, here I am using the laser pointer on screen, doesn't work. Okay, so this term, this formula I sub E is the formula for the external indeterminacy of a structure, right? So here's a structure, it's got uh, reactions, it's got internal releases, and so we can determine whether or not that structure is unstable, stable and determinate, or stable and indeterminate by computing the I sub E value, right? Now remember, a non-negative value of I sub E does not guarantee that the structure is stable. The, the reactions can't all be concurrent and they can't all be parallel, right? Because if they're all concurrent, we basically have a wheel, right? And it doesn't resist rotation. Uh, and if they're all parallel, it doesn't resist translation uh, uh, perpendicular to the uh, direction of the reactions, right? Now this is the external indeterminacy and we also did internal indeterminacy of, uh, of trusses, right? And the formula for I sub T, the internal indeterminacy of a truss, was M plus R minus 2J. M being the number of members, R being the number of reactions, and J being the number of joints. Um, and again, this truss has to be externally stable, uh, and it has to be constrained against rigid body movements. What is true about both of these formulas in the way that they're written is that we essentially have I equal to the unknowns minus the knowns, right? And regardless of which formula that we're looking at, that was kind of the truth with both of these expressions. For example, with trusses, right? The unknowns for the truss were the reactions, and then there was one unknown per member, right? The axial force inside the member. It was one unknown per member. So M plus R was the total number of unknowns. In terms of the total number of knowns, well, for every joint, we had two known equations of equilibrium. The sum of forces in the x direction and the sum of forces in the y direction both being equal to zero. So this was the, in, the expression for internal indeterminacy. The same thing with this, okay? The unknowns were the reactions. The knowns were the three equations of equilibrium and equations of condition, all right? Does that make sense? Both expressions were that way, okay? For beams and frames, the formula is a little funkier, okay? It looks like this, okay? So it's the quantity 3M plus R minus the quantity 3J plus EC, okay? So I'm using the same terms as before. M is the number of members. R is the number of unknowns. J is the number of joints. E sub C is the total number of equations of condition. So I propose to you, though, that it's still the same concept, right? This I term is the unknowns minus the knowns, okay? So what are the unknowns for each member? Well, I, or for, sorry, the unknowns for the structure, not for each member. The unknowns for the structure are the reactions are, but why do I have 3M for each member? Like with trusses, it was just M plus R. Why is it 3M plus R for beams and frames? Well, for beams and frames, 
when you cut a section through a member, there are at most three unknowns. An unknown axial force, an unknown shear, and an unknown moment. So the unknowns are 3m plus r, and that's unknown for every member, right? So 3m plus r are the unknowns. The knowns are E sub c, the equations of condition, but now 3j. Because we're dealing with a structure that's a frame or a beam, one that is flexural, right? That, res that, not, that carries not just axial load, but shear and moment as well. The j for every joint, I can write three equations of equilibrium. Some of forces in the x direction, some forces in the y direction, some of moments, all being zero. So this is the expression for I sub F. I'm calling it I sub F because it's the general purpose expression for uh, indeterminacy for beams and frames. Now, if you take this structure or this, this uh, structure of this formula and look at a beam, right? So here's a beam. Let's just take this beam. This beam has two joints and one member. Is that a fair statement? That's typically what beams are. They're horizontal collections of members. So if you take this I sub F formula and say, okay, what's the indeterminacy of a beam? So it's 3M plus R minus 3J plus EC. So M is 1. So 3 plus R minus 6 plus EC. So that ends up being R minus EC plus 3. And that is just IE, right? So there's kind of a special case of this formula where if you're looking at beams, then the I sub B formula is just the same thing as I sub E, okay? Now, you could say, wait a minute, what if you think about you know, this beam, what about this beam, right? And this beam has a roller here and a roller here and a roller here. And you might say the beam has, I don't know, four joints and three members, right? Well, because you're talking about beams, there's always one more joint. So if you have M members, you have M plus one joints. And so if you replace j with m plus 1 and factor it all out, you'll get this, okay? Does that make sense? So yes, yeah, so that's just sort of a special case. So for frames, this is the uh, means of computing the internal indeterminacy, and if you're looking at a beam, it just happens to be that I sub b and I sub e are the same thing, okay? Any questions? Does that, does that make sense? All right, now let's talk about shear and moment diagrams for internal hinges. That was just me off to the side. You know, I, we never talked about that, and I thought let's just take a few minutes and discuss that. Now let's get into our real topic of today: shear and moment diagrams for beams with internal hinges. And so that we haven't talked about that yet. How does an internal hinge affect the construction of a shear and moment diagram? The answer: it doesn't. It really doesn't. Okay. Now here's the longer answer. Whenever you have a beam like this one that has an internal hinge, we are going to use this equation of condition to solve for the reactions, the reactions at A and the reactions at B. And so those reactions are going to satisfy that equation of condition. Okay? So those reactions already take that into account. And so once you solve for those reactions, it's like that hinge doesn't even exist. Okay? And when you construct the shear and moment diagram, if you do it correctly, you will find that the internal moment is zero at that hinge. Okay? It will already be taken into account. And the reason it's already taken into account is because you've already taken it into account. You already used that fact to compute the reactions. Okay? Make sense? So here's our task for the day. I have a beam with a fixed support at A. I have a roller support at B, and I've got this internal hinge right here. I've got distributed loads and concentrated loads. We need to draw the shear and moment diagram. Now, notice I did not give you the reactions. I want to go through this start to finish. I really want to chug this out. I think this is a very valuable exercise to sort of put a bow on our discussion of shear and moment diagrams for beams uh, in general. 
So, no, I don't want my annotations. So here's the problem. So, let's move this right there. Okay, so here's our problem. And while you all are, are drafting this out, let's see if we can identify some values about our problem. So we have a roller support here at B. So this is BY. And this is a fixed support. How many reactions do fixed supports have? Not one, not two, but three. Three. So we have a vertical reaction here. We have a horizontal reaction. And we have a moment reaction. So we have four unknowns. We have four unknowns. We have four equations of equilibrium. Sum of forces in the x direction equals zero. Sum of forces in the y direction equals zero. Sum of moments about any point equals zero. And sum of internal moments at the hinge equals zero. Because we got ourselves a hinge right there. Now, is there one reaction I can solve for right now? A what's that? AX. AX. So note. Sum of forces in the x direction equals zero means that AX equals zero. That, that's easy. So we have sum of forces in the y direction, sum of moments, and sum of internal moments at the hinge. Let's use a little bit of strategy before we start chugging this out. If I sum forces in the y direction, what's going to happen? I'm going to get AY plus BY equals all this hullabaloo going down, right? It's not going to get me towards an answer, right? What about sum of moments? I can sum moments right here, but I'm going to get MA, I'm going to get BY times this moment arm equals all that hullabaloo going the other way, right? It's not going to get me anywhere. Typically, when you have a problem with an internal hinge, it's more often than not wise to use that first, okay? So whenever we see an internal hinge, what should we be thinking that we need to do? Cut a section using our uh, secret weapon, the samurai sword or the lightsaber if you happen to be a sci-fi fan. So I want to cut a section through this hinge. Now, which direction should I look? Right. I'm lazy. So, let's do that. Section one, one. Looking right. This is me just constructing this section. So here's the, uh, the distributed load. And how much is that distributed load? I believe it is three kips per foot. Now what is this dimension right here? 20. Right? Okay. So I can collapse this into a single point load that is what? And that's a moment arm from the cut of what? 10 feet. And then remember, the only thing that we have is a shear, right? Remember, when you cut a section, you have a shear and a moment. But 
we're cutting through a hinge, okay? We're cutting through a hinge, so there is no internal moment. So if I sum moments at the hinge, what do I get? I get 60 times 10 and by times 20. I think I can do that one in my head. Is that, did I do that too fast? Is that, is that okay? We'll stop for a sec. Everybody good? Now, we do not need to do this. I want to be crystal clear. What is V for this free body diagram? Can anybody look at this and tell me what V is going to be? 30. Positive or negative? Keep that in mind. So are you telling me that at the hinge, the shear is positive 30 and the moment is zero? Is that what you're telling me? Keep that in mind. Okay. Now, because I'm lazy and I don't want to keep drawing this structure over and over again. Oh, goodness. Let's go back to the original structure. Actually, here, hold on. Let me do this. But you can see that now we're sort of at a new part. Okay, so let's go back to the original structure. So here's the original structure. And so what do I know now? So here's the original structure. I know that this vertical reaction is 30 kips. I don't know what this is. So we'll call that AY. And we still have MA to consider. Notice how I also just said, you know what, we don't really need to draw this AX because we know that's zero. So I left that off this time. So far so good? So now let's look at the original structure. Let's see if we can solve out this original structure. So um, I got this distributed load. Let's collapse that into a single point load. How long is the entire beam? 50, 60, 80 times 3 is what, 240? So I can collapse this into 240 kips. That's 40 feet. 40 feet. All right. So how many unknown vertical reactions do we have? So why don't we just sum forces in the y direction? Let's just do that. So summing forces in the y direction going up, I've got AY and I have BY which is 30 kips 
also going up. And as for going down, I have 240 and I have 90. So AY plus 30, so maybe I'll be complete here and say this is BY up here. This is 330. So AY is positive 300. 300 kips going up. And I'm sure that there's a couple of you are like, Dr. Mike, will you just pick a way of writing your Ys? Like there's this and there's that. Just, just, just pick, a, pick a way. I know, I know. One of my little quirks. So this is 300 kips. And so now we can sum moments. And I'm going to sum moments just about point A just for simplicity, right? So <clears throat> let's sum moments about MA. So I've got MA, I've got it acting this way, right? So this is MA. Do I have to consider, yes? So can we actually look to sum moments of A if the area underneath is equal to what it should be? Wait, say that again? So like when we're drawing our shear moment diagram, to the, uh, the oh, I see what I, I see. What you're so you're saying? Don't worry about so, uh, actually solving for the reaction. You're saying just draw the shear diagram, yeah. compare the areas, and whatever the differential in areas is, that's your reaction. That works too. That's actually a valid way of doing it. My suggestion is, see, what I'm doing is that's a great that's a great point. My suggestion is what I'm doing is kind of doing both. And if I'm doing both, I should get the same answer. But theoretically, you could do one, and it would be fine. Because when you're integrating the shear diagram, you are summing moments. That's what you're doing. So you're just doing it a different way. That's graphical. This is algebraic. So that's, that's a very fair point, though. Any other questions? This is good stuff. All right. So MA, does AY generate moment? So I have 240 times 40 and 90 times 50. Is that right? And then, bless you, BY is 30 times 80. I don't need all that. I just need like that. Man, I'm hitting these little prongs here on my little cooling fan. This little cooling fan props this up, and I like the angle. So, okay, so 240 times 40, that's what, 9,600. 90 times 50 is 4,500. So, what is that? Is that uh, 14,100? equals MA plus 30 times 80, that's 2400. All right, how am I, what, am I doing it right so far? What was that, 11.7? How'd I do? All right. So this is and we haven't actually drawn the shear and moment diagram yet, but we'll get there. I just want to make sure that this part is good to go so far. I'm going to give everybody a sec to catch up. I, I don't want to rush this. And we got more than enough time. We're actually doing very well.
Everybody good? All right. Again, I'm a cheater. I have another copy of the beam here. So now we can draw our shear and moment diagrams. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this right here, and now I'm going to repeat my reactions. I'm just going to draw them in here. So this was 300 kips. This was 30 kips. And then this was 11,700 foot kips. All right, so go away. All right, so y'all know the drill. Draw your little guidelines, which if you notice on the homework solutions, I actually haven't been doing that. I haven't been drawing the guidelines. But then again, I, I do the homework solutions on quad paper, on graph paper. So, you know, not as necessary. But here where I'm doing it on this screen, you know, kind of important. So if you're doing them on, you know, like white paper or something like that, probably not the worst idea in the world. Okay. So let's see. So again we start with our shear diagram. Okay. So Let's see what we can see. All right, so we start off at zero and we should end at zero. So what's the first thing I need to do? Jump up to 300. Okay, now help me out, what do I do from here to here. Well, well, hold on. 150. A line from 300 to 150. So a line going down like that. So let's see how I can do this. I don't think I'm going to do any better than that, so I'm not even going to try. So that's 150. What's the slope of that line? Negative 3. Negative three. Boom. Okay. Now, all right, what do I do here? Okay, so I'm, if I'm at 150 and, and I, I got to jump down 90, what am I at? 60. So, okay. Now, this is where you got to develop that mental discipline, okay? I told you that the, sh the hinge does not affect anything. So, ignore that hinge. It doesn't exist. Boom, it's gone. What do I do from here to here? A linear path, right? How much am I dropping down? 90. 90. So if I'm at 60 and I go down 90, what's that put me at? Negative 30. Negative 30. So let's see. I'm going to scroll a little bit. I want to get this right. So, something like that. And then what do I do there? Go up 30 and it puts me back to zero. Boom. Shear diagram. Now, Again, that hinge doesn't affect anything, but since we're having a little bit of fun with this, let me ask you a question. What's the value of the shear right there? 
30? Huh. Because we're at 60, we go down three kips per foot, right? Because the slope of this line, this is also a slope of three kips per foot, right? We go down three kips per foot for a distance of 10 feet, so we go down 30, and so that's 30? Well, by golly gosh gee, what did we find up here? Hold on, hold on. Let me put this here. What did we find up here in, in the little thought bubble? We said that the shear was positive 30. Keep that in mind. Well, by golly gosh gee, look at that. So far, so good? It's not bad, right? So now what we need to do is integrate. It doesn't really matter how you do it. We can say 1, 2, 3, 4. We can treat that little triangle, these two little triangles as separate. One of the reasons I kind of wanted to do this, though, is because if this is 30 and this is 30, what's that distance? 10 and 10, right? So because, because it's 30 and 30, we don't have to do some fancy calculation for this. We know that that is 10 feet for both. So <clears throat> let me scroll down a little bit. Let's do this off to the side. So the area of shape 1, right? So shape 1 is this trapezoid. Remember how you do the area of a trapezoid? You average the 30 and the 150, and you multiply it by the base. So plus 300 plus 150 over 2 times 50. What is that? Eleven thousand two hundred and fifty. So this is plus eleven two fifty. What about shape two? Shape two is positive sixty plus thirty over two times ten. What is this? 600? Yeah. Yeah, this is four. I know what you're doing, yeah. <coughs> There's a reason I'm doing it this way. Oh. So this is positive 450. Now, what about each of these triangles? They're both the same, right? So like this is triangle three, this is triangle four. What's the area of triangle three? Say it again. Oops. Positive 150. And the area of four is negative 150. Now, what happens when you sum these areas up? What do you get? Okay. What do you get, though? Say it again. 11,700. So what he was saying was instead of solving for that moment reaction, you could just do this, and whatever this is, that's the moment reaction the other way, right? That, there's actually nothing wrong with that. I kind of like doing both, though, because you should get the same answer, right? That's a very astute observation, okay? Make sense? But I did want to split this triangle up into two areas because I wanted to know what the area is on this side of the line and the area on this side of the line for a very specific reason. Oh. 
So this is our moment diagram. I'm putting the moment label over here. So what is the very first thing that we do on our moment diagram? Drop down, 11,700. Notice how I'm not even looking at the beam. You know, I needed to know what that reaction was, but I'm not even looking at the beam. Again, that hinge has, it doesn't matter. It doesn't exist anymore. The hinge, just get it out of your memory. So 11,700, and then I go up 11,250. So what does that put me at right here? What's that? 450. Not 450, but negative. negative 450. So I'm at negative 450. So that's like this. All right? Let me ask you this. Option one, option two. Which is it? One, right, there you go. It goes a lot to a little. So that means it's going to go like that. Let me see if I can do a little better than that. Sorry, hold on. All right. Now what happens from, from here to the next point? I go up 450, right? If I go, if I'm at negative 450 and I go up 450, what's that put me at? Zero. And then, can anybody guess what it's going to look like from here to here? It's just going to go like that, right? Lot to a little, little to a lot. In fact, this is all the same parabola. So, if you're good at it, you can sort of draw it like this, like that, to where it's all like the same parabola, and that is 150. But look at what happened. With, I ignored that hinge. That hinge didn't exist at all when I drew that shear, or that shear diagram and that moment diagram. And what did I get? I got the shear is 30 and the moment is zero. Those reactions accounted for the fact that the internal moments at the hinge were zero. So once we did that, we, we didn't need to worry about that hinge anymore. The statics took care of everything else. What do you think? This isn't too bad, is it? What time is it? Come on. Wake up. All right. Does anybody have any questions? So we only have one topic left in my opinion, in terms of shear and moment diagrams, and that's shear and moment diagrams for frames. They're not any harder. They're just like that, okay? So Wednesday, we're going to do shear and moment diagrams for frames. Friday and Monday, we are not in person, okay? There will be pre-recorded lectures on the YouTube playlist. I'll do the YouTube premiere thing like I did last time. Um, leverage the technology, you know? Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm letting you out five minutes early. That's all I got, everybody. I will see you all on Wednesday.